was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You had me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into Yeah.
We're grateful to be able to come here and worship you. Lord Jesus, you are the great one among us. Your name is high and exalted above every other name. We're grateful, Lord, that you love us, that you're for us and not against us. And you demonstrated your great love by sending your son that we might have life in him. Father, we're grateful for those that are in Christ this morning. There is now no condemnation. You've removed our iniquity, our sin, our rebellion against you and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. Oh, thank you for the joy we have in Christ. Lord, we love you. May you be honored in our midst this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, you may have a seat. We've got a special treat for you this morning. Our kids are going to be joining us and singing us a couple songs this morning. And before, they, uh, before we do that, I just have one announcement for you. Um, the women's Bible study is going to be meeting, prayer uh, breakfast is going to be meeting this coming Saturday at uh, 8 a.m. over here in the Activity Center. So if you want to come out for some good food, great time of prayer and in the Word, um, uh, join the women for that. All right. And uh, we want to welcome you. If this is your first time here at Harvest, we're grateful to have you join us for worship this morning and uh, to be able to celebrate what it is the Lord has done for us. If uh, you want to find out more about the church, join us, uh, see us out at our welcome desk out there in the foyer. So with that, we'll let you, uh, let the kids take over.
Thank you very much. We want to thank Fran and Jill and Savannah for doing a great job of leading them. Let's give them a round of applause. And all the adorable kiddos. Great job, kiddos. You can follow your teachers on out, and you all may get around and greet one another. Thank you.
we put the slides up on the uh, display up here? That'd be great if we could do that. You know, one of the things that uh, just ticks me off is um, when, when I get scammed. I mean, don't you hate getting scammed? We had a brother here in the church a while back. He'll remain nameless because I don't want to give him credit. But he, uh, he knows that I'm somewhat of a germaphobe. And um, he took these brownies and he molded them into little mouse turds. And I'd come in and there'd be mouse turds all over my keyboard and all over my desk. I'm like, where is this mouse coming from? And so, you know, I'm wiping everything down and I'm, I've got, I got mouse traps all over the office, you know. And it just, it went on for months and it was so frustrating. And then of course, you know, uh -huh, I, I got you. And you, I just hate that. And, um, and there are, there are religious scams, right? And, and we see religious scams all the time. I mean, look at, look at some of these charlatans that you see on Christian television. And these guys and these women are making just fist loads of cash off of gullible followers of Christ. And they have oceanfront homes, and they have private jets, and they've got all the trappings of the, you know, super rich. And they're becoming filthy, stinking rich off of the sincerity of, of the gullible followers of Christ. Now, today, we are, of course, celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Now, it could be a scam. It, it, it certainly would not have been the first religious scam, and certainly it's not the last religious scam. And I don't want to be scammed, and I'm sure you don't want to be scammed either. So when we're trying to figure out whether something is legit or not, you try and apply certain types of evidence to make sure you're not getting conned. Now, the greatest source of evidence, or the greatest type of evidence, I should say, would be empirical evidence. Now, empirical evidence is where you're taking what is being claimed and you're able to duplicate it in a laboratory so that you can observe it for yourself to see if it's true. Empirical evidence is knowledge acquired by observation or experimentation. Empirical evidence is information that justifies believing that something is true. So somebody says to you that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees centigrade. Is that true? Well, you go in the laboratory, you begin to drop the temperature of water, and right there before your very own eyes you can see that yes at 32 water begins to freeze but we're talking about an historical event or something that was supposed to have happened in history well there's no way you can apply empirical evidence to an historical event you can't duplicate it in a laboratory and so you have to apply abductive reasoning and what abductive reasoning is, it's a method of reasoning that involves inferring which of several explanations of partic for particular observed facts is the most compelling one. So we look at the resurrection of Christ. Well, what happened there? Did, did, did uh, somebody steal the body? Uh, perhaps Jesus wasn't dead. Maybe he just lost consciousness. They put him in the grave. He came to in the middle of the night, stumbled out of the grave, out into the Judean wilderness, and his body was lost forever. Or possibly he really was raised from the dead. So you look at the facts, and then you ask yourself, which of these possible scenarios best fits the facts that we are given? For example, Lincoln was supposed to have been shot on the 14th of April. He died on April 15th, 1865. Of course, everybody wants to kill themselves on April 15th, tax day, right? But, uh, but is it true? Did it really happen? Well, what do we know? What are the facts of the case? Well, we've got newspaper articles. We've got interviews with eyewitness accounts. We've got photographs of the actual funeral procession. We've got photographs of the nation in mourning. 
It's true that we don't find anything written by him after April 15th. We don't have any, any speeches that he gave. And so you look at the evidence that exists and you think to yourself, well, I suppose I don't have to suspend my logic and reasoning to buy into the idea that, yes, Abraham Lincoln died on April 15th, 1865. Well, the same thing is applied to the resurrection of Christ, though we cannot duplicate it. What are the facts that we are given, and do we know uh, which of these particular explanations would fit with what we know about this case. Now, Matthew, he's the only one that gives us a little bit of this insight at the end of Matthew's gospel in chapter 28. Of course, you remember, Matthew was a government employee. It shouldn't surprise us that Matthew would have friends in high places, that Matthew would have some understanding of some behind-the-scenes meetings that were going on. And Matthew tells us about a meeting between the tomb guards that Pilate allowed to be sent there, and they come to the religious leaders and they report unto them the crazy things that had happened. And Matthew then tells us in chapter 28 and verse 12, and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they had sufficient sum of, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and they said, you tell people that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were sleeping. Again, that's stupid. I mean, how do you know what happened if you were asleep? But that's the story that they came up with. The religious leaders, rather than accepting the story of the guards, they actually end up paying hush money. Now, what this reveals to us is that both camps, those who were pro-Christ and those who were anti-Christ, both camps believed the same three facts, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and on the first day of the week, the feast of first fruits, the body was missing from the tomb. So they agree, this is what the reality on the ground in Jerusalem was. Both friend and foe were in agreement with that. Now, if you go to WikiHow and you type in the search bar, how to successfully lie, or how to get away with lying, a subject all of us are deeply interested in, I'm sure. Uh, WikiHow will then give you uh, the top three things that you've got to do to get away with telling a lie. Number one, we are told that you've got to keep your your lie simple. You don't wanna go crazy with details. You get a hundred details out there, that's a hundred details you got to remember, and the more details you get out there, the greater the likelihood you're going to get tripped up. Remember when your parents kind of caught you doing something very bad and they began to drill down on you? Where are you at? Right? You understand, okay, I got to keep this very, very vague here. Uh, I was uh, I was out that's where I was at. Yes, I was out. Well, what do you mean? Oh, well, I was, uh, I was around. Yeah, that's it. I was around. Who are you with? I was with, I was with people. I was with other human beings, right? You want to keep it vague. Don't get the details out there. You're going to get tripped up. Number two, you need to avoid telling other people, right? The safest lie to tell is a lie that you and you alone are telling. You begin to get some of your buddies in on the line. Now you got a bunch of moving pieces here that you got to manage. You know what's going to happen? The cops are going to take you and your friends, going to put each of you in an individual room, going to ask you the same question, and they're quickly going to begin to figure out whether you're lying or whether you are telling the truth. You got to keep it to yourself. And then thirdly, You've got to make the lie plausible. Don't go crazy with the lie. Don't shoot for the moon with your lie. You can say that the largemouth bass was eight and a half pounds. You can get away with that one. You can't get away if you say it was 225 pounds. You got too greedy with your lie. So you've got to make the lie believable. Now, I would suggest unto you uh, that the disciples violated all three of these principles. And when we look at this as a lie, it just doesn't make sense. Now let's notice as John, I'd like to turn your attention to John chapter 20. 
And here in John's gospel, he gives us a very brief um, description of what happened uh, that, that morning. So we begin in verse 1, and we read that it was now on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene, she went to the tomb early, while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And then she ran, and she came to Simon Peter, and the other disciple that Jesus loved. Most scholars believe that this was just how John would refer to himself, the author of the Gospel of John. John never calls himself by name. And said unto them, they have taken away the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. And Peter, therefore, he went out with the other disciple and uh, were going to the tomb. And so they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first and then stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Again, that's kind of consistent with, with John's uh, attitude, John's character. He's more of a contemplative kind of guy. And so he gets to the mouth of the cave and he just doesn't rush in. Now, on the other hand, we've got uh, ready, aim, fire, Peter. Notice then Simon Peter came following him and went right into the tomb. There's no hesitancy at all. And he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been about the head and lying uh, with the linen clothes but folded together in a place by itself. And then the other disciple came into the tomb, uh, who came to the tomb first and went in also and saw and uh, believed. Now John is possibly telling us that he was the first of the disciples to uh, buy in uh, to the reality that Christ is indeed raised from the dead. Now again, if you're going to get away with a lie, you gotta keep your lie simple. Now let's notice all of the useless details that we are given here in this short story of the resurrection. First, I want you to notice that we're told here that it was early on the first day of the week. Does that really matter? Right? The first time that you read John chapter 20, did you think to yourself, I'm so thankful they told me it was early. It was so meaningful. It was just so eye-opening that they told me it was early. Now you could care less. What does it matter whether it was early or late? It's, it's on the first day of the week. And notice how early it was, we're told here, that it was while it was still uh, dark. Again, who cares? Does it matter whether the sun was shining or not? Now, they do give us a detail here that is rather curious that they tell us that it was Mary Magdalene who was the first one to make this discovery. And this is an incriminating detail because you remember in first century Israel, this is a very patriarchal culture that women and women's testimonies were always looked upon with a little bit of suspicion. In fact, in the Jewish Mishnah, they declare the oath of testimony is conducted with men and not women. We don't need women and all their emotion in this courtroom. We just have guys giving testimony. In the Jewish Talmud, they said, eligible witnesses must, in all, almost all cases, be free men who are not deaf, mentally or morally unsuitable, and particular women are, in most cases, not eligible. The place of a woman is in her home and not in a courtroom. Can I get an amen from the brothers this morning? <laughs> Chickens, every single one of you, right? But this was the world. And you remember when the women reported this to the disciples, Luke tells us in chapter 24. But their report, the women's report, it seemed to them, the them, Right? These great men of faith, the disciples, like idle talk and nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and he ran uh, to the tomb. Now, notice her testimony here. Again, self-incriminating her lack of faith. They have taken the body. These religious leaders, they've taken the body. She doesn't say, 
Oh, praise God, the word of Jesus has come true. He said he would be raised the third day. Here it is, the third day. He's not in the tomb. Oh, God is so good. No, she's not operating off of faith at all. She's saying, hey, these low-life religious leaders have stolen the body. They're probably desecrating it right now as I speak. Now, also notice that we're told, and I've mentioned this in the past, that the other disciple outran Peter. Again, who cares who won the race? Now, he's writing his own gospel. You write your own gospel. I suppose you can toot your horn whenever you want. And so here's John saying, oh, by the way, I outran Peter because, again, I think that's kind of central to the story. And notice he swings back around and says, the one that came to the tomb for, yes, John, we know. You outran the older guy. Good for you. Now, also notice what we're told here is that he bent over. It's irrelevant. I don't I don't need to know that. And he didn't go in. Again, I don't need to know that. And then notice that we're told that the clothing was folded by itself. Do we need to know that Jesus made his bed uh, before he left the tomb? Again, I don't think that it's necessary. Now, when you have a suspicion that somebody is scamming you, one of the things that you're always trying to do is you're trying to figure out who this person is. You're trying to measure this person up. Are they fast talking? Are they kind of slick with their words? You're trying to figure out if they have got uh, the intelligence uh, to pull off a scam and to get somebody as intelligent as you are uh, to buy into their scam. And what we have to remember is that these disciples, they don't come across with a great deal of sophistication. They don't appear to be terribly deep thinking people, at least at this stage of the game. In fact, when you look at the details concerning the disciples, they're dull, uh, they are selfish, uh, they have a track record of failure uh, behind them. And even look at the scenario that we have here. You've got women going to the tomb, and if you skip down to verse 20, we're told there that they were hiding behind locked doors because of fear of the Jews, right? So the women are putting greater bravery on display than the disciples themselves. Now, there's another interesting thing that Mark adds to all of this. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, he says, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk, and he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, Joseph was an honored member of the high council. He was was part of the Sanhedrin. Now, if you are making up a story, you're not going to be dropping names where your story could either be validated or proven wrong. All they had to do is make a phone call to Joseph's office, talk to one of his staff people, and say, hey, did Joseph go and get the body? Can he verify that the body was dead? Can he verify that he put it inside the tomb? Uh, J.P. Moreland, professor at Biola, says this, the mention of prominent men indicates that this account is not fictitious. If the disciples had created this story, it would have been counterproductive to make up a person that was supposed to be in a prominent position. This could easily have been refuted if it were not true. Now let me give you three simple reasons of why I believe the story of the resurrection is true. Number one, I believe that it's true because of the rise of Christianity in the city of Jerusalem. This is where the story was first told. They didn't go to Alexandria. They didn't go to Athens. They didn't go to Rome. They started in the very place where if it were a hoax, it could have been easily proven to be so. A number of years ago, in fact, quite a few years ago, I was a teenager, mid-70s. I had recently come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and there was a comedian. There was this evangelist that was traveling the country. He was 
beginning to be wildly popular. He was a very charismatic guy. He's one of these guys that could just sort of hold you on the edge of your seat with these crazy stories, wild stories this guy would tell. His name was Mike Warnke. Mike Warnke actually made an album that was recorded here in Fort Wayne. And I have only been a Christian now a year, maybe two. I was very impressionable. And whenever I heard that Mike Warnke was coming to Fort Wayne, I made sure that I was in the audience. And he would tell these crazy stories. He was a warlock, and he had all these witches that he had control of. He's a big drug dealer. He's in Vietnam. All of these insane stories. What a life this guy was living. And he was making an incredible living off of it until a journalist from Cornerstone Magazine, and would to God Cornerstone Magazine was still up and running today, we would all benefit from it. But Cornerstone Magazine sent this journalist to the hometown of Mike Warnke began to talk to his classmates, began to talk to next door neighbors, began to talk to people in town that knew him. And here they discovered the whole thing was a complete hoax. That he could get away with it, away from his hometown. But in his hometown, that would be the one place where your lie is going to be discovered. And this is exactly what the believers were doing. They were first promoting it in the city of Jerusalem. Josh McDowell, he says the message of a risen man could not have been maintained a moment in Jerusalem if the grave was still occupied. N.T. Wright, he says, uh, that is why as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. These religious leaders are making millions and millions of dollars off of selling Judaism out of the temple in Jerusalem. And now they are beginning to lose customers, and the best way to bring their profits back would be to simply disprove the story that these backwater hillbillies from Galilee are filling the streets of Jerusalem with. But the fact that they were getting away with it in Jerusalem I believe is a very strong point for the reality of the story. I think the second reason is the persecution and the deaths that were endured by the disciples. You look at Matthew, he's killed with a sword. Mark is drugged by a horse through the streets of Alexandria, torn to pieces. Luke, he's hung in, in uh, Greece. James, the brother of John, he's beheaded in Jerusalem. James the less, they throw him from the pinnacle of the temple. He survived the fall, they then crushed his skull with rocks. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Thomas was run through with a spear in East India. Peter was crucified upside down. On and on it goes. And again, uh, um, J.P. Moreland says, and they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any payoff from a human point of view. It is not as though there were a mansion awaiting them on the Mediterranean. They faced a life of hardship. They often went without food. They slept exposed to the elements. They were ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned. Finally, most of them were executed in torturous ways. For what? For good intentions, no. Because they were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had seen Jesus Christ alive from the dead. What, what you can't explain is how this particular group of men came up with this particular belief system without having had an experience with the resurrected Christ. Why do you lie? You lie to get out of trouble. You don't lie to get in trouble. You lie because there is something positive that you think that you're going to gain. Why do we have these men cooking up a lie from their own imagination and then going out and dying for it? Now, a jihadist will die for a lie that the imam has told them, but where are the imams that are making up the lie and then dying for their own lie? 
Why in the world would these guys fabricate these stories and then suffer? What did they get out of them? And then I believe the third uh, reason is the change in practices by thousands of Jews. These are religious legalists. Have you ever talked to a religious legalist before? Have you, have you met any of these people? You know, people that are so narrow-minded, they can look through a keyhole with both eyes. You know, this is, this is how you are baptized, and these are the clothes that you got to wear, and, and this is the kind of haircut that you need to have. And they carefully lay out how you and I are to be exercising our Christian faith. They don't believe in allowing us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And how often do you see a religious legalist turn from their legalism? That is a rare event indeed. Again, Moreland, he makes this observation. The Jewish people believe that their institutions were entrusted to them by God. They believed that to abandon these institutions would be to risk their souls being damned to hell after death. Now, a rabbi named Jesus appears from a lower-class region. He teaches for over three years, gathers a following of lower- and middle-class people, gets in trouble with the authorities, gets crucified along with 30,000 other Jewish men who are executed during this time period. But five weeks after he's crucified, over 10,000 Jews are following him and claiming that he is the initiator of a new religion. And get this, they are willing to give up or alter all of their social institutions that they have been taught since childhood have such importance both sociologically and theologically, something very big is going on. And you begin to look at everything that we are told that takes place there in Jerusalem in the weeks following the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I would put forth to you that this is strong evidence indeed that Christ is risen from the dead. And then, of course, we have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a mover and shaker in ancient Judaism. The Apostle Paul was the big gun of Judaism. This is a man that everywhere he went, everybody knew who he was. Everybody was high-fiving him in the marketplace. Everybody was just standing at awe of this guy's commitment and this guy's you know, diligence in following the law. This is a man who his own testimony was believed that he was righteous before God. This was a man who believed that he had kept the law of God. But this guy has a testimony that he had an encounter with the living Christ that he and his buddies had crucified weeks before this. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this guy writes, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He is the first one to be raised from the dead, life eternal, and that is what is promised to each and every one of us who claim to be his followers. Now the resurrection of Christ is central we find the resurrection mentioned in every sermon in the book of Acts. And here is a man who has everything. And by his own testimony, he will eventually say, I have lost everything because of my proclamation of Christ. Here's a guy that has everything. And then he loses everything because of his story. All he has to do is recant. Isn't it interesting that not a one of these guys rolls on the other disciple? Isn't it fascinating that not one of them going to these torturous deaths then say, ah, okay, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was all Peter's idea. I went along with it. It's all a big lie. This is where we buried the body. Now look, who dies for their own lies? I suppose an insane person might, but here you've got all of these guys. Are all of them insane? And when you read their writing, are you reading you know, the, the ramblings of a Unabomber and his manifesto? No, you're reading logic. 
You're able to follow their reasoning. You're able to follow the history that they are laying out. There is no evidence at all that we are dealing with insane guys. We are dealing with guys that basically say, you can brutalize me, you can brutalize my family, you can do whatever it is that you want to do, but I am not changing my story. I saw a dead guy alive again. And the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest evidence for the proof of the resurrection of Christ. How do you explain the mover and shaker of Judaism allowing his fortune and his fame to disappear because he simply said, I saw the guy that we had killed and he is alive forevermore. Now, the resurrection is necessary for salvation. The Apostle Paul says to the Romans, salvation is as near to you as your own mouth and your own heart. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now I know that so many of us in here were saved. So many of us in here have placed our trust in Jesus Christ. But I wanna make sure that all of us are saved here. I wanna make sure that all of us, when we leave this place this morning, that we are at peace with our Creator. And when we lay our head on our pillow tonight, we will be able to drift off to sleep knowing that we are square with the God who has created us. And you can be made right with your God by simply turning and saying yes to Him. Yes, I believe that your work is what saves me. You're not saved because you're at church every time the doors are open. You're not saved because you give donations to the church. You are saved because you are trusting in what Jesus Christ has freely done for you in the cross and in the empty tomb. Would you like to turn to the Lord this morning? Would you like to leave this place knowing that your sins and your iniquities are forgiven? It's a quick fix. It's a simple solution. You just simply turn and receive the gift. Salvation is a gift. It is not a reward. Salvation is not a reward for a job well done on planet Earth. It is a gift. And what do you do with a gift? You simply receive it. You take what is being offered to you. Listen to me. Jesus Christ is not your enemy. Jesus Christ is in love with you. And Jesus is offering you eternal life if you will but turn, change your mind, and receive that gift. Would you like to do that this morning? I ask you to do a somewhat difficult thing, but it's something that so many of us in this room have done in one form or another. And that is, I would simply like you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pray for you. Is there anybody here that you want to say, I, I want to leave this place. I, I want to be right with the Lord. I want, to, I want to say yes to Christ. Just raise your hand, and I'm going to pray. Is there anybody here you want to say yes to the Lord this morning and leave this place in a right relationship with your Creator? Is there anybody? Now, for those of us who are the followers of Christ, the Apostle Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall be changed in a moment in twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we are living in psycho days. 
We're living in crazy times. But the word of the Lord to you and I is, look, let's be steadfast. Let's be immovable. Let's always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Your king loves you, and your king is alive. And let's pray that his power and his strength would be manifested in our lives this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great grace. We thank you for your rich love. Lord, I thank you that this room is just filled with so many stories of how we came to you with years of insanity behind us. We were so foolish. We were so stubborn. And Lord, out of nowhere, your grace appeared. Oh, Father, thank you for your rich love. And thank you that you have left this story that has been proven with many infallible truths, that we have not followed the cunningly devised fables of men, but we have followed the truth of God. Now, Lord, help us to live for that truth and help us to die for that truth this week. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand as we close this song. Sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains. And stood in our way But he came And he died And he rose Those giants are dead now So weak that we could barely pray 
love us and that you've saved us. And God, that your son, he, he bore the cross and he, and he beat the grave. And God, that is why we're here. We're in celebration for the finished work of Jesus. And God, we're so thankful for the blood of the sinless lamb that took our place. As he took that path of, of a prisoner's death, God, he hung on that cross for us. And God, we will forever be indebted to that beautiful act of love. So God, thank you for being so gracious. Thank you for being so merciful. We are so unworthy, but God, you are worthy of our praise for the beautiful sacrifice of Jesus. So God, thank you. It's in your precious name we pray, amen. Have a great week, church. On this cross was our victory won. By his love, he would Self could not enslave the